Hello, good morning. I'm so glad to be here. And thank you so much, um, Shuli and colleagues um, from NIE and also the ITED. Uh, it's sometimes like feeling like sort of having a second home in Singapore because you have so many interesting projects and uh, groups and then the kind of values that we are sort of working together on is very similar. So um, it's actually my privilege um, to be here to be um, joining this celebration um, event. So, um, and what I'm going to share today um, is a project or, I mean, around a project that we don't have the title called uh, knowledge building, but it's actually very much underpinned by knowledge building um, concepts. And it's actually also uh, building on the, the years of experience um, we gather in Hong Kong. We actually um, started knowledge building and knowledge, um, uh, and knowledge forum, I think, starting from 2002. So it was a long, long time ago. And um, so we had years of that. And so the talk I'm having today is on, the title is called A Social Technical Infrastructure to Support Multi-Level Agency for Knowledge Creation in Hong Kong Schools. Uh, I would actually be uh, very interested to hear later on, um, would it echo your experiences? Okay. so. What do we mean by um, knowledge building? If I, if I sort of say that it is a co um, core capacity and disposition for everyone in the 21st century, do you agree? Yes or no? Really? Really? Well, first of all, if we say knowledge building, I would, I would refer to it as a collective capacity and disposition. Now, collective doesn't mean that we don't have individual responsibilities. But to be able to knowledge build, as you all know, it has to be working in a collective. But how do we actually do it? Actually, it's not so straightforward. And so, so what we are doing in Hong Kong, I mean, the projects that um, I'm trying to lead, is to create the conditions to scaffold the process of building collective knowledge building capacity and disposition. And what do we need to do that? I think there are two core conditions. One is an accessible pedagogical model. Now, I know that you are all working with um, the knowledge building principles. We've actually worked with teachers on knowledge building principles. But we find it to be very, I mean, it's, it may not be that the principles are difficult. But it's so distant from the teachers. When you talk about it, they don't feel that they know about it. And so to, to actually spread it is difficult. And because if we talk about collective, what do we mean by having a collective capacity? It's not just working at the classroom level. It's not just the students' knowledge build. The teachers need to knowledge build, and the principals need to knowledge build. Right? And how do you get everybody to feel that they are affiliated, they know something about the pedagogical model, they think that they, they can contribute to it? Because first of all, when we talk about knowledge building, it is your confidence and your inclination, your willingness to contribute to solving problems, right? So, so basically, because of this, we've actually focused on something called self-directed learning, which models behind a problem-based um, learning uh, kind of model, which I will talk about a little bit more. So, so because we need, so the pedagogical model need to be grounded 
on, robust, on a robust learning theory, and it also needs to be pervasive and consistent for everyone, for all stakeholders. And then thirdly, it has to focus on providing social cognitive learning experiences. And then fourthly, it has to be supported by an aligned knowledge building learning environment. Now, I'm sure you have a lot of tools and things to work with, including the Knowledge Forum. And um, so for me, when I think about knowledge, um, say a learning environment, it includes, of course, artifacts, tools, but also the social infrastructure. And in fact, uh, you are doing the same because you have your network learning communities. So we are also designing that. So in order to provide a good learning environment, we need to provide tools that empower the learners. And when I say learners, it's not only students. Learners meaning students, teachers, principals, and us, researchers, teacher educators. Um, and then it should empower us to collaborate, create, reflect, and make learning outcomes visible. And then we need to scaffold the design of learning experiences, and we need to structure and scaffold the social organization and interactions for problem solving and knowledge advancement. So uh, this is the project that we, we actually started two years and a bit ago. So we started this self-directed learning in science project uh, in September 2014. And um, so for the students, of course, I mean, this was funded by the Education Bureau in Hong Kong. And the primary goal is for students to gain knowledge and skills in self-directed learning through scientific inquiry so as to equip them as capable lifelong learners. So what is self-directed learning? We make it very simple. So it means that students need to take responsibility and agency for their own learning. So the self-directed learning, we say it would have sort of five key um, stages or elements. It doesn't mean that it's linear, it can reiterate, but basically it's to do with goal setting, self-planning, self-monitoring, self-evaluation, and revision. So, um, So it's um, very simple, in, in so I, I don't want to um, spend too much time on explaining what it is. So you can just take it at face value. And because we want it to be accessible, so, um, so it has to be fully integrated into the daily teaching and learning practices in schools, in classrooms. So this one we integrated into the science KLA means key learning area in our own jargon. And so the bubbles you see on the screen, they are the sorts of a sequence of um, activities that needs to be uh, involved when one is conducting a scientific inquiry. So we want to make knowledge building something or self-directed learning something that is authentic, that is necessary for the teachers. So we're working with science teachers, and so we can actually, so the bubbles were the terms in the science curriculum under scientific inquiry. And so we say that, and then we can map the bubbles with the five um, sorts of um, stages or five uh, dimensions of self-directed learning. Um, why we chose science, well, we chose science because we chose one um, subject area. Before, when we were working with uh, knowledge building, we didn't actually, um, we, well, we worked with all subject teachers, so they, they work together. But then we find that teachers are very much sort of focused on the everyday work. And so the depth and intensity of knowledge building was actually more or, or higher quality if they can work with teachers within their own domain. So that's why we, we, we thought, okay, let's start, this time we try to do it with um, science. And so in terms of the, um, in terms of the not learning environment, we created several things. One is a learning uh, and assessment platform, which is um, a customized from Moodle, which we call iLab. 
And then one is uh, a learning design studio, which is a software to support teachers in uh, design of learning experiences. I will be showing them to you. And then the third is um, designing an organizational structure and interactions to foster multi-level knowledge building agency and leadership. So, um, okay. So in terms of the um, uh, multi-level agency, we consider that we would have four levels, students, teachers, school leaders, and then the, the whole innovation network. And so um, I'll go to the, uh, so this is the iLab. So I will try to go to the iLab platform. Yes. So um, this platform actually we use to support all um, our learning activities. That means the workshops we, we uh, or, or meetings we hold with teachers, um, the schools um, working with themselves, and the students working amongst themselves. So it's a pervasive platform. So when I log, in, so everyone logs in and they see the the page as it's customized for um, for their role. So this one is the front page for which you see all the badges of all the, this one is the primary schools. And then here you see all the, all the schools um, who are participating that are the primary schools, sorry, the secondary schools. And then if you go, so this is the page, when you go into one of the, um, one, uh, I can't, uh, so this is the, the, from the teachers. So this is how, um, when I log in, this is what I see, because, um, so I would see the, all the courses that we offer uh, from the Center for IT and Education, this is all the primary schools, all the secondary schools, and so, and so on. And then so, when you log in to the, um, maybe I can, yeah. So if you log into um, it and look at the, um, if you're interested in the primary schools, so each school can go in and click in and then go to their own um, website. Um, so these are the secondary schools. Um, and this is one of the course room of the secondary school. So they organize it however they want to organize it to be. And then say, for example, this one is, um, this one is a site one. Uh, no, so it's one of the, the schools on, uh, on water, sovereign, and so on. So, so we leave it for the for the teachers to um, handle. This is our own um, uh, workshop. This was the latest workshop that we held um, on. I oh, know this is not the latest. This one was one in in, in May. So this is the the. Um, so you may say, how is it knowledge building? Um, it's not just in the discussion. We do have a discussion and um, forum, but actually the entire set of activities is important. And then we also have um, a learning uh, design studio. And so in this case, say for example, we would have, uh, we ask the teachers in there. So they need to be thinking about the learning outcomes. And um, so say they would say at the beginning whether, okay, so, um, they would have, so we um, talk about what do we mean by self-directed learning and um, yes, so we defined what self-directed learning is because the goal setting, uh, self-planning, self-monitoring, uh, self-evaluation and then revision. So, so we provide a kind of like a rubric. So. Um, on the left-hand side, that means there is no self-directed learning at that, for that aspect. And then, so if there's a level one, it means the teachers play the key role and then the students just follow. Whereas, so this is level two, which is the students starting to take more responsibility and this one, the students take most responsibility. So we have more like, behavioral descriptions of how um, the student would be like. And then, so the second step, we would have the, the teachers designing the activities, and we can, and then they sort of look at the time, 
And then so we see how much, say, discussion and then investigation, creating, the students creating things. So these are the percentages of time that the students, so we want the teachers to think about how the students' experiences would be like, not what the teachers is doing. And um, we also ask the teachers to think about time, not only in terms of the classroom um, interaction time, but also, so there's in class, um, there's also, so in class, uh, there is just, um, you know, uh, activities which are not mediated with e-learning, this one is mediated with e-learning, and this is the after class. So even after class, we can, uh, so we need to plan and let students to understand what's the expectation of what they, they should be doing. And what's actually, um, I, uh, what we added in, the last part, is in fact to add in a kind of um, space for teach, teachers and hopefully later on students to think about what they have actually achieved in terms of the five dimensions of self-directed learning. And so in this case, um, this one we started with the teachers. So the teachers can capture evidence of students' learning. And then because they started by, in the, in the step one planning, by specifying which level of um, achievement they were expecting the students to be able to do. Now we don't want, so we, from the start we said to the teachers, don't think that in each of your learning um, unit designs that you need to cover all five elements of self directed learning because you have to get the students to go step by step. And then also it doesn't mean that if you target the highest level, that would be the best. So, so the teachers start thinking about what they want to do. And then when they, after they've done it, um, they try to collect evidence. So for each of the activities, we ask them to think about what would be the evidence that this particular activity would be promoting learning in a particular aspect of self-directed learning. And then so at that point, they can also put in which level they have, okay? So, so in a way, this one becomes a kind of uh, reflection too. At the moment, it is a reflection too for the teachers as well. So say for example, self-evaluation, the teachers can capture the uh, discussion um, both in class and also online. Right, so these are, and then the students also revise their uh, setup and so on. So this is the two for, um, for learning. And then, right, okay, I better test. Okay, so, I've covered both of these. And then now comes to the social um, infrastructure for um, scaling up, or actually for the network to really uh, learn and propagate this idea of self-directed learning. So we started by involving 20 schools in the network. Why 20 schools? Because we be, because I was very much interested in the issue of scalability. Can we scale? Because if we're always you know, recycling and, and you know, I'm always thinking, is when we say scalable or sustainable, then it should be that when, when we from the university are not contributing anymore, they should still be thriving. That's the exit test for scalability. And, and so I'm very much um, a believer that schools are complex systems, and so you need a kind of a minimum number to make sure that uh, you would have a critical mass. So we started with 10 primary schools and 10 secondary schools, and uh, we tried to get sort of a more, well, 10 or 20 is nice in terms of having good numbers, but at the same time, it doesn't always allow more intensive interaction. So we group schools into smaller clusters so that they would also have regional, so we have school-based um, um, 
co-planning uh, meetings, we have cluster meetings, we have uh, network meetings, and so on. So, and the second year, we add five more uh, primary and five more secondary, and we have the original red schools, which is from the, who, who uh, participated from the first year, uh, with the, we, we remix the, um, the cluster structure, and in the fourth year we add five more each. And so we actually find that, you know, from the second year on it's so much easier, because now the first year teachers, they were taking their lead and they are helping the other teachers who are joining in. So we have co-planning um, lessons uh, where they um, identify, so the teachers identify topics that they want to work on. They integrate uh, blended learning approaches in the classroom online, and then also they have, um, they design and refine their learning activities, resources, and tools. And they also design assessment activities and rubrics. So um, here are some of the photos um, of their work. And we also have what we call leadership circles. And it's somewhat uh, similar to what you might also be doing later today because uh, you want to have uh, principals engaged. So, but we want the principals to be also uh, participating sometimes in this. So we have monthly meetings uh, in the project. But there are two occasions uh, during the year we have uh, principals to be joining the whole network. And so we have part of it where the teachers are sharing their experiences like our normal monthly uh, workshop, but the principals are observing and they're sitting with the teachers in their own schools. And then they then uh, split up into teachers and principal meetings. So, and then we also want to have um, multi-level interactions involving not only principals and teachers, we want the students and also people from the community and even the policy makers to come and share our, you know, the success of the students. So, so what we did was, um, maybe I should actually go to this one first. Okay, so we have, um, so at the end of the year, we invite the students to join in well, actually, of course, through their teachers. So each school would then, so we, uh, we encourage them to have a kind of like an internal, um, well, not quite competition, but more like, okay, so we, they sort of um, self-evaluate and say which group's work seems to be the uh, most interesting. And anyway, it could be the whole class. So they decided what they want to show to other schools in terms of their uh, self-directed learning outcomes. And um, so it is an event where we also invited um, people from, um, so say they, so we have a poster session first. So students from the participating schools, each school has a poster board and then they show what they do and they explain why, it, so what they do in terms of um, goal setting, self-monitoring, and so on, and what's the outcome, and how did they do it, how, the, and then, so what you see here is, um, so we have um, judges going around, and who you, um, the one who's standing next to me was our former president, uh, president of our university, and he's actually uh, the chair of, uh, or the president of the Academy of Science himself, so he, he is a scientist, and he's actually very much promoting STEM education in Hong Kong, and we also have, um, say, um, the lady on the right. Um, she's actually the assistant, uh, the senior assistant director of education, looking uh, in charge of curriculum development. So, um, of course, um, it's not just the um, the judges or ever. Actually, parents. Some parents also come. We invite the parents, and if they come, we want them to also evaluate the projects. And we have the students going round and asking each other. So. Okay, so that's the social organizational infrastructure. And now I'm going to um, share with you an example of a multi-level self-directed learning example within a primary school. And it is in how they, so, and focusing actually very much on how the teachers learn. 
through you know, working intensively as one of the teams within a particular school. The, um, this particular unit is in primary five, and the focus was on getting the students to invent their own electric fan. And so the teacher said, okay, um, after learning about the um, closed circuits, uh, they want the students to be able to design their own portable um, electric fan. And so the question they set for the students was, would the size, material, and number of blades the, well, actually, this is not how they. No, this was the actually this was the question that the students, after some time, uh, decided that this is what they need to inquire. Okay, so um, so the the students actually enjoyed it um, very much. Now, just a little bit of background: How do the schools collaborate? Well, first of all, it's not just coming to the workshops. Each school in joining the project. A, the principal has to commit to allowing the teachers to come and work on the project so that they would be released you know, once uh, an afternoon in a month to work with other teachers. Secondly, we want more than one teacher, minimum two. And the best we recommend is at least the teachers at one grade level of the school, and preferably also involving some um, sort of senior teachers in the school who would be helping and guiding. And then third, they must try out a self-directed learning unit in science in, um, well, in each semester. And for one of the semesters, they must have an open classroom. That means they would have to be opening up the classroom for other teachers and principals and whoever else um, wants to uh, in, involve in the project to go and observe. So this is the context. And another context I want you to understand is that in Hong Kong primary schools, there is no single subject called science. We only have a subject called general studies, and that was the change that took place in the late 90s, and it's very controversial. But in any case, so, so that means no teacher would identify, so, it's, so out of a weekly five um, lesson general studies, there were two lessons that are supposed to be given to science. And then, um, I mean the equivalent of two lessons, so 40% of the correct general studies curriculum is science. And so no teacher, say A, Hong Kong primary teachers are not confident about science. And now with this uh, dilution, they no longer feel that they are science teachers. So, so they're normally um, not really very familiar with the content or, or they actually worried about teaching it. Okay, so but it turned out to be a success, of course. Now, so I want to share with you the process through which they actually um, uh, did work towards this. So they decided to use this unit as the for the open classroom. Okay, and within the team, so it's like you're watching a movie. Okay, so there are four character, no five characters. A, B, C, D are teachers in the school. A is in fact a Chinese language teacher in the school. But she's a senior teacher and she's looking after school-based curriculum development. B is, so the, class, the school has two classes of grade five. So they are B and C. So C uh, is in charge of the, um, of the general studies subject, so she's the panel head of general studies, and so she has agreed to be opening up her classroom for others to observe. And then D is um, uh, the, the sort of deputy subject panel, so um, he also comes to participate in the planning meetings. And then E, the expert, is in fact uh, my colleague from the university on the project who's uh, sort of providing both Sub subject matter and pedagogical uh, advice. Okay, 
And this, and we were so surprised that after, you know, at the end, I mean, I went, I went to the open classroom. I looked at how the students learn. I was very um, impressed by what went on. And then later on, I found out that in fact, these teachers, I mean, there were nine lesson plans all together. So the, the one I observed was the ninth lesson plan. So they had eight iterations of revisions. So you, we can actually see knowledge building and lesson design co-construction through cycles of collaborative refinement, enactment, reflection, and revision. Now, I don't think you would be able to read the text carefully, but uh, what is interesting is that, okay, so I'm going to um, explain to you how the whole cycles work through. So to start with, the first plan was done by B and C. So the two teachers teaching grade five. So they put forward a plan. They submitted the plan, or they gave the, shared the plan with A, who's the panel head. Now normally, of course, they would not give it to the Chinese language teacher, right? But because now she is a member of the team and she's panel head, you know, the, the subject head for correct school-based curriculum development. She looked at it and she then came back. She sent back, um, you know, some comments, basically asking, it, she said, you know, because the, it was very much sort of getting the students to have some hands-on work, which wasn't there before, so it was already an advancement. But then the, this, the curriculum uh, head said, I don't see self-directed learning elements. You must give some choice to the students, and then you must have some assessment activities. So she wrote down some suggestions. So that was the first iteration. The second iteration, they then um, have the, um, so after, the, because within the, this cycle of co-planning and open lesson, uh, observation, we always have one meeting that one of our colleagues go to the school and co-plan. So before the co-planning with the expert, they decided to have their own co-planning meeting first. And then during that meeting, so you can see that, say, the first iteration, now I, I, I was wanting to have the red color, but I forgot. So the, so the first iteration, there was an improvement in pedagogical knowledge. The second uh, iteration, again, they had further refinement on the pedagogy. So again, the pedagogical knowledge. And then the third refinement was when my colleague went and, do co and did uh, co-planning with them. And so um, he decided that, so he suggested they should be strengthened in terms of um, the scientific um, um, terminology and also some of the concepts and then also suggested some um, e-learning activities in the form of getting the students to do some search on the web. So in this case, we see that the, the improvement is in the area of content knowledge and then also technological, pedagogical knowledge. Then they then have another um, co-planning meeting before, okay, so they decided, well, because they feel that the open classroom was such pressure. So they wanted to try the, the lesson plan out first. So C was the one who's doing the open classroom. So B said, okay, I will teach it first. So B taught the class, and then afterwards they revise it. They revise it, and then importantly, what was, so I'm not going to go through the list um, stage by stage, but what, but what was quite interesting was, after the first enactment, the C and A talked together, and they said, it still feels very boring. The students, I don't think the students are very engaged, and so they thought about making it more engaging. But what was very interesting was, they started, what started was teacher A asked a couple of scientific questions about you know the fan the motors and currents and so on which because she doesn't know she's a chinese language teacher and then of course teacher c was not um was not very uh, and, um sure either and then at this point teacher a went for uh, a study trip outside of hong kong so 
they decided they need to work with each other um, on WhatsApp. And so, so these teachers, so they, and then what is quite interesting is that they started getting the, the equipment home. And so because the, in order to answer those questions, they actually did their own inquiry before they've never actually engaged in scientific inquiry themselves, I mean the teachers. So this time, uh, you can see, and then they were actually taking, so they, these are authentic videos. They were taking videos to share with each other. <laughs> And not only, not only the teacher, this is the teacher's son. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So it was so they became you know very interested in it. The the son was saying because you know because they were designing different shapes of the fan and then he said I didn't realize so he he tried what he, his mom did but then he flipped it the other side and then the the wind comes out not from the front but from the back of 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 the fan so so they actually so they were so much interaction over the few days and actually a who's the curriculum person actually um WhatsApp her friends, and her friends also try something, and WhatsApp her back. So you act, and and so and they actually also went to us. They went out to buy these um, motors and things, and they talked to the shopkeepers, and the shop uh, shopkeepers also gave them ideas. So so this sort of fascinating, um, intensive learning activities among the teachers and their immediate. Um, community actually gave them a lot of innovative ideas and the teachers were learning both the content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge and technological knowledge. They decided, so they, um, they decided they, they can actually get the students to do more self-monitoring using the tablet and taking the videos. And, um, and my colleague who also, they actually, after that, they call my colleague and can you come again? Because we promise only one visit per school, per trial. And then they say, can you come again? We really, really want your suggestion on the e-learning and so on. So, and then after that, the teacher actually um, see who's the who's teaching the open classroom. She decided she want another trial herself. So she was teaching not only primary five but also primary six. So she said, she tried to uh, justify why she can do that. Because, well, even though the, pri the primary six students, they've done the electricity unit last year, but they haven't done the experiments. They should be able to benefit from it. So she decided to change, uh, to introduce one lesson in the primary six. So she tried once. And then, so the open classroom, and then, of course, she then also went through another, uh, you know, couple of, of revision cycles before we saw it. So we actually see intensive learning experiences um, happening within the, um, the classroom. And so, so this is the kind of overall how we were trying to look at, and we're actually seeing the escalation of, um, learning and sharing. And every time the teachers meet together, they are, we can actually feel the buzz of energy. And they were sort of, and because over time they were, because some of the meetings were within the schools, not only I think about four of the meetings over the whole year is taking place in the university. All the others are happening in the schools. And so the, the teachers become very familiar with each other. And so they have this kind of buzzing energy. So, um, so this is what I have to share with you on the social technical infrastructure to support uh, knowledge building in schools. Thank you.